Friedman Financial on North Shore 104.9. My name is Mark Friedman. I'm president and CEO of Friedman Financial, located in Peabody, Massachusetts, right across the street from the North Shore Mall and just above the soon-to-be-opened Daniela's Restaurant. I hope you're all doing well. I hope you all enjoyed Halloween last night. I hope you're warming up because it was c -c 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 cold outside last night. Um, you know, there was, certainly the numbers of kids out trick-or-treating weren't nearly as large as we've expected in years past for a number of reasons, of course. Uh, but still, it's fun. I mean... I don't know about you. As you drive around your neighborhood, you know, we, years ago, people started decorating their houses up for Halloween. I know we had all the blow-ups in front of our house. My kids love the blow-ups. In fact, in our old house, people used to drive by our house because we had so many blow-ups. But is it me, or are people making the front of their houses far scarier? They're like gruesome decorations people are putting up in front of their house. It's not the friendly uh, Mickey Mouse with a holding a jack-o'-lantern in his hand anymore. I mean, the skeletons, the gore, the, um, the agent of death, whatever might be there. It's been some of the scariest stuff. I mean, it is spooky to go out there. Um, granted, it was a little cold last night, so I think people stayed in, but driving through the neighborhoods and watching what some people have done, and people have gotten very creative. Frank, look, this has become, Halloween has become a billion-dollar industry. Billion-dollar industry. It's amazing. When, I mean, I remember when I would go out trick-or-treating. Remember we used to have a little UNICEF box? we go out and people would drop pennies into the UNICEF box or dimes into the, that box and they'd hand you um, a dum dum lollipop or Smarties or a little thing of candy corn. Um, we, we, we've certainly all stepped it up. I know we are a uh, full-size candy bar house, uh, but I think, cause I, think, I think we're competing with others in the neighborhood. It feels like everybody does the full-size candy bar thing. And look, they're, they're easy enough to get at Costco or at BJ's and um, that's what we've been doing. But and nobody, nobody wants those little uh, white and red starburst little uh, mints anymore. Um, it's been different. And then some people say, you know what, we're not doing candy. We're going to give apple slices, packed apple slices, or pencils, or something like that. Look, everyone's being creative. So I'll tell you something that we did for Halloween. We set up a table, because, you know, you're supposed to be the socially distant kind of thing. Um, you know, we're, we're friendly, of course, and we'll get the kids what they want. But we set up a table, and I have three domes on the table and the dome covered three different plates. And so as each kid would walk up, I would say, um, which dome would you select, would you like? And so I was only touching the tops of the dome that I would lift up, and then they could grab the candy. So I would have two tricks and one treat under the dome. So we might have Skittles under one, a Milky Way under another, and a can of tuna fish under the third. And so the kids were a little surprised when I would lift it up and it was a can of, you know, Charlie by the Sea tuna fish. And, you know, I, we'd laugh it off. I didn't make them take the candy, of, take the tuna fish, of course. They could have the candy that you want. The biggest risk you run, you lift up the top and it's a Reese's peanut butter cup and they say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm allergic to peanuts. I know what that's all about. I got two kids that are allergic to peanuts. And so, you know, you got to accommodate. But we had fun with it. And that's what we did to make it at least a little entertaining. When we last left, though, I was talking to you about the three critical pieces that we need to be aware of as we head towards the end of this year and into 2021. The election being one, the, um, the, a therapeutic or a vaccine being number two, and the stimulus. But if I rank them in order, I think a vaccine or a treatment is absolutely number one, the election, number three, and number two is the stimulus. Look, when we get a vaccine or whether there's a solid treatment where we can feel comfortable about getting back to life, the market is going to explode. I have no doubt about that. We're going to spend money. We're going to go, want to go out. When's the last time you got excited about going out shopping? I, I mean, you do it online, right? But I want to go back out and shop. When's the last time you bought clothes? Clothes that you could actually touch, that you could try on to do. I want to go out and do that stuff. When's the last time you went on a vacation? and bought souvenirs and you know went to a hotel. We're gonna spend money as soon as we're comfortable to do so. But in the interim, there's a lot of people who are still out of work and a lot of people who are truly struggling. And frankly, I blame Congress and the Senate for not being able to figure out a way to work out a strategy where we can allow the American citizen those who have really struggled with their jobs, those that are in the service industry, those that are in the hospitality and entertainment industry, how do we get some money to them so that they can feel 
like they're appreciated even, so that they can have money. We need to figure out a stimulus for them, and we need to figure out a stimulus for the small business owner. You know what, I think as much as the restaurant industry has struggled, and yes, many restaurants have had to close, and that's unfortunate and terrible, but there are many other restaurants who, cre who became creative. They figured out ways to incorporate takeout into their operation. They used outdoor seating, which now is getting limited with the winter coming. They've been thoughtful in the way they've been able to manage their stuff, but they still want to get back to full capacity and working again. It's the retail shops that have really been hurt. We need to figure out ways to get the theaters back open, to get the stadiums open, for us to get back to normal and a stimulus for those people whose time has not yet come and may not come for a few more months is critical. But what was also interesting and encouraging, frankly, from the first stimulus package that came out, the savings rate in America went up 30%. People were as frugal as ever. They were saving money because they knew that times could be tough for a while. But all of that saving that they did is now getting spent because they were hoping that the stimulus would continue. And unfortunately, they need to pay their rent. They need to put food on their table. They need, they need, to, they need money. That's how we all survive. Now, there is a large percentage of this population who has not been impacted by it. And we've felt, frankly, some benefits. Look, my industry, my industry, um, the healthcare industry, all of the, there's a bunch of industries that have actually, I don't want to say benefited, but have not been impacted so harshly from COVID-19. But as politicians, we need to recommend, recognize that we are a country of red states and blue states, of all Americans, and we need to take care of everybody here. We gotta figure this out, and I will tell you, when we do figure it out, that's gonna help this market and help the economy too. Now here's my feeling. With an election just two days away, if I'm the Democrats and I'm feeling good about Joe Biden winning this election, and I feel that there's a potential for the Democrats to take over the Senate, I wouldn't want to have a deal right now, frankly, because if I could have all, have the blue wave, they call it, I could probably get a stimulus package far greater than the one that I'm asking for now. Now, that's not helping people, boots on the ground people, but potentially it could be better. Look, we've been talking about a two point something trillion dollar bill, a stimulus package. I wouldn't be surprised if there is a blue wave, that there's a five trillion dollar package that is so large that Americans feel good. And when Americans feel good, what are they going to do? They're going to spend money. They're going to get back to work. They're going to start doing things. And that will benefit the economy. But in all truth, folks, I think I shared with you my personal perspective. And I, I look, what I, I don't know. Look, I, I thought for sure Hillary Clinton was going to win by a landslide in 2016. So what do I know? But I'm going based upon the information that I've gathered from a variety of Washington experts. And my gut tells me that Joe Biden wins this election. Not by much, by the way. Um, he'll win it huge in the popular vote. But I don't think he wins it by much on the Electoral College, but I do believe he wins. But I also believe that the Republicans hold on to the Senate. And that brings us back to where we were today with an inability for people to move. And we need to get past that. And as American citizens, we can do better. And I hope that we're all going to tell our congressmen, our politicians, our senators, even our new president, whomever that might be, that we need to work together as a country. We need to get ourselves out of this mess because we are the greatest country in the world and we have the ability and the resources to do that. We can be creative. We can work together. And I'm excited about whatever the outcome is because I believe that we will come together in some of the most darkest times. There are better days ahead. And I actually believe they're coming sooner rather than later. That's my thought on the election. I hope you all get out and vote. I think it's very, very important for you to have a voice, for your kids to have a voice. And here's one of the things that's interesting to me. 
Um, my sons, Jerry and Noah, are off at college. Both of them got absentee ballots. Noah sent his in right away. Jerry, who's down in Florida, decided he's not going to send his back. And I said, Jerry, why aren't you going to send yours back? And he says, because, Dad, the decision's already made in Massachusetts what's going to happen, so it doesn't matter whether I vote for Biden or for Trump. It doesn't matter. He says, you know, here are my, you know, the friends that he surrounds himself with in Florida. Give him all the reasons why he should vote for Biden. But other friends that he's hung up with, has have hung out with, have given him all the reasons to vote for Trump. And he says, Dad, I just don't care. And I said, Jerry, that's too bad. I said, you know, but I, but I think his, his, his voice to me is very similar to so many other people his age. Is that they'll go to rallies, they'll sit around and have these discussions late at night. But with the actual action of submitting your ballot, or going to the polls has to happen, they don't want to do it. Something else better came along. I believe it's our civic duty, and I think it's our job as parents to do our very best to get our kids to go to the polls, to submit their applications, I mean, to submit their absentee ballots. I don't know how successful I am with Jerry. I'm trying my hardest. But I thought it was interesting that my daughter, Alana, who's 21 years old, is eligible for the first time to vote in a presidential election. And she lives in Rhode Island. And she felt so strongly about voting that she wanted to vote in person. Because she's never done it before. She had no idea what to expect. She didn't know what a ballot even looked like. And so that's why I went with her on Monday to the senior center in North Andover when we voted early. And it, it, it was a proud moment for her. And, but I also believe if two years ago I'd asked Alana to go to the polls to vote, and in fact, I think we did because we, there was an election two years ago, she had no interest. Now it matters to her. And I think there's something that comes with maturity from our kids. As they get into their 20s, as they get into their 30s, they realize how important this is as a civic responsibility. And I hope you'll encourage your kids to do the same. We're going to take a quick break in a minute. And when we get back, I want to read to you a piece that was written by my friend Steve Barine, who is a financial advisor in Denver, Colorado. He writes a column for the Denver Post. And I thought his summation of what's going on in America, what's going on with the elections and how we prepare for it, and how fear shouldn't be driving us down a path that, down a path that we really think we should be concerned about. Fear shouldn't be it. We shouldn't fear fear. I want to talk to you about that. I want to share that with you. And I also want to remind you before we go to break that we do put out a free weekly newsletter every Friday at 10.30 in the morning. It's called Planning Pointers. Go to our website, freedmanfinancial.com. That's Friedman, to E's and a D, financial.com. Go to the bottom of any page, put in your name, your email address, and we'll get you signed up for this Friday. And of course, if now is the time for you to get serious about your financial planning needs, I hope you'll reach out to us. Schedule a free initial consultation, and I'll look forward to seeing you, but I'll be talking with you in just a minute or so. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Dollars and Cents with Friedman Financial on North Shore 1049. 